Welcome everybody. It's our privilege to have a Sabbath school class in here and some other classes here every, every Sabbath, but the university allowed us to use this particular uh, spot with the understanding that from time to time there would be others who would come and would want to speak to a larger <coughs> audience. I'm very happy to announce that uh, David Newman is with us today, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Branstetter come and tell you more about why he's here and what he has in mind. Thank you. Well, good morning. That's a tall order you've given me, <laughs> Dr. Hart. I can tell you he's here in order to attend a meeting of the board of Adventists today. Now, you know what that is. I'm, I'm hoping that you're all regular readers because Dr. Newman is the editor of Adventist Today, but his, his work in editing and producing readable material goes back a long way. Uh, he was editor of Ministry Magazine for many years. Fifteen, did you tell me? Eleven. Eleven. A little bit less, eleven years, but that's a, a long stretch. And in, in those years, as you can well understand, he became closely connected with many, many departments in the World Church. And uh, since that time, he has been pastoring in what he refers to as uh, New Hope Church. I, it's somewhere in the, in the area of Washington, D.C. And um, he has built that church up to a substantial membership of some 700 souls. And I would call that a successful pastorate. He has recently retired from that role and is embarking upon doctoral studies. So you see, he's a man of many parts and a very broad and extensive acquaintance with the church as you and I know it and love it. We've asked him to speak on a subject of his choice and uh, just where the church fits in to the work of God in the world today. Anyway, he has chosen as his title, uh, what you see on the board here, uh, the real last warning message that God has for the world and how the church is involved. Dr. Newman, welcome to our place. These are special people. They are people from more than one Sabbath school class and they are on your side. I have a mic here. Is it? I think I turned it on? Yeah. You're okay. All right. I'm okay. Before I get into my presentation, let me just uh, do a little commercial on what I am doing. I've just uh, been accepted into a PhD program, research PhD in London, England, and the working definition of my dissertation title is How the Adventist Practice of Ordination Comes from the Catholic Church and not from the Bible. And what I'm seeking to show that this whole issue of women's ordination is not the real issue at all. The real issue is why are we men ordained, since it's a Catholic practice, not a New Testament practice. And I'm looking, in a dissertation, you always have to do a very narrow slice. So what I'm looking at are the three ordinations, deacon, elder, and pastor. You don't find that in the New Testament, not three levels, each one superior to the other. So. Uh, the, the challenge is it's a three-year program, but if it's going to help the church for the General Conference Session 215, I have to have most of it finished before Annual Council of 214. So the next two years are going to be very, very busy years as I do the, the research for this, which I hope will provide a very, and then I will propose in it what we will do instead of, if we get rid of ordination, what do we put in its place? But that's another subject for another time. Before we begin, let's bow our heads in, in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Every day is a beautiful day in your love and in your care. We adore you, we love you, we thank you for being so interested in us after you created us that you came to live amongst us and to be with us and to understand our joys and our pain. We love you and guide us now in this presentation that your love will prevail and we will get a a greater glimpse of what you want for your church in these last days, we pray in your name. Amen. 
My view of God today is very different from what it was when I was growing up. And perhaps the best way is to tell a little story. My father was a missionary in Africa. I grew up in Africa. My mother would teach my sister and I home school, and we always prayed for it to rain. Because when it rained on the tin roof, the corrugated iron roof that was over our house, it was so loud you couldn't talk, and so school would be dismissed for the duration of the, of the rainstorm. Can I interrupt for yes. just a second? They say we need to turn your mic up. Where's the... Oh, all right. I didn't know there was a volume on the mic. Yeah, there is. Is that better? Go ahead. All right, let me continue. Okay, so this saying on that. Excellent. So my sister and I would talk and we'd say when it was raining that the sound of the thunder was God throwing naughty children down the stairs. And then the rain that would fall were the tears of the children as they felt the pain of falling down, down the stairs. And then my mother would remind me, because I was the eldest, that I had to be kind to my sister because every time I annoyed her or said a bad word, the angels in heaven were writing down every word in the book of life. And one day that would come up in the judgment. And I always felt I never wanted to come to the judgment because how embarrassing it would be. Because the Bible said that every word, every deed would be brought before the, the whole world. And even when I understood we were saved by grace, I still understood that it was still going to be an embarrassment because God would say, yeah, you're saved by grace, but everyone still needs to know what your thinking was and your thoughts and so on. So that was kind of my, my concept growing up, that there was this God. Then when I went to the seminary, I had to take a field school of evangelism as part of the training. And the big night was when you presented the mark of the beast, the Sabbath. And the evangelist would tell all these stories of people who had been to previous meetings who hadn't made their decision that night, who on the way home were in a car accident and got killed. And then the implication was left, if you don't make the decision tonight, that could happen to you and you won't make it, make it to, uh, to heaven. And that was how I was taught and how I was trained. And when I married my wife, who was a convert at age 17 to the Adventist church, that was her understanding of the sanctuary in the last days, and she would tell me how she would pray that she would die before the close of probation because there was no way that she could make it, make it through, especially as it was also emphasized to us that uh, we had to be sinless. And so I went through seminary. I got an A in righteousness by faith, but did not understand righteousness by faith. I became a pastor in Scotland and still didn't understand what grace, I, I had the theoretical kind of knowledge. Then one day, God sent a little lady from the Caribbean to my church in Perth, Scotland. Her husband was on a golfing vacation at Glen Eagles, which was a few miles from us, and she gave me a little magazine called Present Truth, edited by Robert Brimsmead. Now, when I was at La Sierra College back then, I'd transferred from Newbold, Robert Brimsmead was in his heyday in the 60s, and Elder Heppenstall came and did a week of prayer to combat Brimsmead and his perfectionism. But when I read this magazine, I discovered that he had changed his whole view and was presenting the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith. And I sent for all the back copies, and they all came, and I read them, and suddenly I began to understand what salvation was all about, not just in my head, but in my heart and my emotions. I'd even wondered whether I should continue as a pastor. But after that, I got so excited about the gospel when we uh, came to, to um, America um, and started reading uh, George Knight. I came across this quotation that, um, in one of his books from Ellen White, which revolutionized my life. Ellen White says, those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold your God. The last rays of merciful light the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory, and in their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Now, I was taught that the last message was the Sabbath truth and the mark of the beast, and that's why the Adventist Church is here, to warn the world about this and to prepare the world for these cataclysmic times. But when I read this quote, and let me go back. The last rays of merciful light, the last message is what? A revelation of his character of love. 
And I looked at that and my whole life changed in my focus and what I was going to do within the Adventist church and with the people um, around. I thought, what is Ellen White saying? Where is the mark of the beast? Where is the Sabbath? Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe in the Sabbath very strongly when we understand it in the right way. And as far as end time events, well, I'm not quite sure that every detail is going to happen the way Ellen White predicted. I've come to the realization that this conditional prophecy in Ellen White is in the Bible, but that's for another whole uh, subject. And if you read Adventist today, you will gather some of their th thoughts from me and Alden Thompson, who's also been writing in the same, same area. And then, as I went back to the Bible, suddenly a text sprung at me, a text that all of you know so well. Jesus is talking to his disciples at the Last Supper, and he says this, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if what? If you love one another. But we have said the way we know who the remnant church is are those that keep the commandments of Jesus and have the faith of Jesus, those who follow the Sabbath. That's who God's people are. But Jesus said no. The way we're going to truly know who God's people are is by the way we treat one another, the way we love one another, the way that we are concerned with one another. After I looked at that, and growing up on both sides of Adventism, from the legalistic side to the grace, uh, grace side, I then, the, the message of Jesus in Matthew 24 came to my mind, where the, the Pharisees, who loved to rank the commandments, which is the most important. They didn't just take the ten, but they would try and, and argue this one was more important, so they thought Jesus might have some good ideas. And so they said, which is the greatest of the commandments? But Jesus went much deeper. You know this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that what God wants first is a relationship with his people. See, it's the Adventist church. We've talked a lot about behavior. We haven't talked too much about relationships. And I'm not arguing against behavior. It's very important. After all, it was Jesus who said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So yes, the commandments are very important. But when we stress the keeping of the Sabbath, when we stress all the things that are going to happen in the last days, we are really focusing on, the last, uh, on, on areas that don't excite people or encourage um, people. Paul, in writing to the Galatians, says, clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. You see, law is behavior, love is relationship. And if you don't have the right motivation, doing all the right things are not going to count at all when it comes to eternal, to eternal things. Ellen White in Gospel Workers says this, of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. Just pause there for a moment. Of, of who? Of what? All professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. The proclamation of the third angel's message calls for the presentation of the Sabbath truth. This truth, with others included in the message, is to be proclaimed, but the great center of attraction, Christ Jesus, must not be left out. If you ask the average man or woman on the street what they might know about Seventh-day Adventists, what will be their usual responses? Or oh, you're the people that worship on a different day, you know, if they know much about us. Or you're the people that don't eat pork. Or you're the people that dress a, a certain way. Or you're the people that have that great medical institutions and so on. Have you ever heard anyone say, oh, you're the people that love Jesus the most. You're the people who help in the community more than anyone else. You're the people who lift up Jesus more. And here Ellen White is saying, of all professing Christians, we should be known for what? Lifting up Jesus before the world. So there's something wrong with all the right things that we say and believe if the center is not perceived by the public, if the center is not perceived by the people um, around. 
It's been 160 years more than that since our church, since 1844. And I want to show a couple of pictures that some of you may have seen and some of you may not have seen that I believe illustrate very well the dilemma our church is facing today. We're in the 21st century. Why are we still here? Now that's a whole other subject uh, that I won't be getting into today. But our church began to, as a, uh, we said, to continue the Reformation, to add additional truth, one of which was the Sabbath. So um, if I can have a couple of volunteers to help me as well hold this, uh, this picture up here. I brought it because um, not ready for this one yet, so we'll, we'll, we'll just wait on that one. Um, you can see it on the screen, but you can also see here. This picture was um, produced by James White in 1876 to illustrate the purpose of the church. You'll see starting in the left-hand corner, Adam and Eve coming out of the Garden of Eden, the sacrificial service, Cain and Abel. In the middle is a law tree with ten branches, one for each of the Ten Commandments hanging underneath. Jesus on the cross, the baptism, Lord's Supper, second coming. And it's from, it's called the way, the way of life. And the emphasis in that picture is what? The tree. Jesus is there, but he's under, he's, he's, he's under, under the tree. Now, if you just keep holding that, let me go to um, a quote that Ellen White said in, 19, in 1890. As a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had a dew nor rain. But before she made that statement, she had begun to feel that that picture was not really the accurate picture of what our church was all about. So she was trying to get James to change it, revise it. He died in 1881. 1883, she brought out a revision. Okay, now we're ready for you to please hold up this one because I can't put the old one on at the same time. And what I want you to see now in this picture, the contrast, what's the center of this picture now? Jesus on the cross. Where's the law? The only place you can find it, it's still there, but it's way in the background at Sinai. The other elements are still there, Adam and Eve, the sacrificial service, the baptism, the Lord's Supper, the second coming. They're all in this picture. But as you look at this picture, and as you look at this picture, you see a huge difference, don't you? And one of the great challenges, keep holding them for just a little bit longer, then I'll tell you because I know your arms are going to get tired. One of the big challenges is how do we achieve balance? You see, I'm not talking about an either or. I'm not saying the Sabbath is not important in end time events. Please do not misunderstand me. But what I'm saying is, what is our focus? What is our joy? What do we love to talk about the most? When we share with other people about who Adventists are, do we talk about this picture or do we talk about this picture? Do people know us because of this picture? And my, my theory and thesis is that today, most Adventist churches, most, and I haven't taken a poll, are still in this picture. And there are some that I call the evangelical Adventist churches, which New Hope unashamedly is. When people join our church there, I tell people we're Christian first and Adventist second. And I have a special class that everyone who joins New Hope has to go through, whether you're transferring or baptizing. They all get a copy of these two pictures, and we explain very carefully what New Hope Adventist Church is all about and how Christ is first and foremost and everything is understood through the lens of grace, not through the lens of our doctrines and specific examples. You can put them down now if, if, you, like, uh, if you like there. And it's, it's kind of revolutionized how people look at because, um, I'll go back to this one, this is what, whoops, This is what I call the behavioral picture. This is the picture of the law. This is about our behavior. And this picture I call the relational picture. And relationships is, is what God wants with us. Because without relationships, it was Ellen White who said, um, and I have this quote here, a loving, lovable Christian is the most powerful what? In favor of the truth. Not how well we know our doctrines, not how well we can give a Bible study, but a loving, lovable Christian is the most powerful argument in favor. And what is a loving Christian? The world unfortunately sees Christians through the lens of that church in Kansas that pickets funerals of gay people 
and holds up terrible signs that they're going to hell and, and calls them all wicked things, or the church in Florida that burns the Koran, or the churches that support abortion clinics uh, being bombed and so on. And the non-Christian looks at that and says, that's what Christians are about because they get the, the news and the headlines. I don't want to be anything like that. And yet, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples, by how you love and how you care for one, one another. There's a quotation in Ellen White that I was brought up with that kind of scared me for a long time. Some of you will know it in Christ Object Lesson 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the man manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It's been used by some as part of what is called the harvest principle. And the idea behind this is, and, and part of the original teaching of the sanctuary was, we have to become sinless before we go the t through the time of trouble, before the close of probation. Because without a mediator, how can we be for forgiven if we sin when there's no mediator anymore? And this quotation has been one of the most prominent in helping us come to that understanding. And then one day, um, as I was reading Christ Object Lessons, I came to page 384. And this is what Ellen White says on page 384 of the same book. She says, um, am I? I have got something out of sequence here. Hold on, what is, um, oh, okay, all right. Just, just looking at, at, my, at my notes here. Uh, before I get to not another quote from Ellen White, not from, uh, um, Christ object lesson. She says, love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. We're trying to, in the f last few minutes of this presentation, understand what does it mean to love each other? Because that's a kind of a vague term. I love ice cream. I love my cat. You know, I love this day and the sunset. Love has become a very debased word. But we can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, love springs forth spontaneously. Oh yes, this is the correct one. Sorry, I've just given you a long introduction. Now here's the, here is the understanding of page 69. The completeness of Christian character. Remember the first one, when character is perfectly reproduced, Jesus will come. Here the completeness of Christian character is attained <coughs> when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. When the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. Now that gave me a whole different perspective on what character perfection is all about. Ellen White says the completeness is attained when the impulse, that is, I don't have to think, am I going to be kind today? Am I going to be loving to this person today? Am I going to help this person today? It's just a natural outpouring of who we are. And it's, nice, it's easy to be nice to the lovely. But when the difficult people come into our lives, it's a whole nother challenge. When the people who judge us, the people who gossip about us, the people who uh, don't pay their debts back to us and so on, it's a whole different matter of how we love them and how we work um, with them. And what Ellen White is saying here is that God is looking for a deep relationship with his people. And out of that relationship will come the best behavior. Because Paul, in writing to the, the um, Corinthian church, you know, tells us that you can have all the wisdom in the world, you can have faith to move mountains, you can, um, brief question? Oh, Christ Object Lessons 384. And I'm going to announce at the end, if you want a copy of this presentation, Dr. Brandstater has it, just ask him, he'll email it to you, it's in, in, in PDF form, so you can have all the, the references. But Paul is saying that we can even um, give away everything we possess, even give our body to be burned. But he says, if, if it's not done with love, it means nothing. And then he describes what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres. So what Paul is talking about here, and what I'm talking about, is the motivation. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist here, why are you a Christian? 
And if you're not a Christian, why are you who you are? When you get up in the morning, what do you want to accomplish that day? When you meet with people, how do you want to reflect the character of Christ to those people? What do you want them to see when they see you? What is your motivation for living and for going through, through life? And Paul is, is saying this in a very strong way. Now, one of the most puzzling texts in the Bible in this whole context is found in Matthew 25. At the end, you have the judgment scene. Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats. And this is what he's saying to the sheep. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Have you ever wondered about that text? Now, if I'm a good Seventh-day Adventist, I'm going to say, Lord, where, where's the Sabbath in that? You know, I faithfully kept the Sabbath. doesn't mention the Sabbath in this passage. And he's commending the righteous. This is, this is the key, the, the, the kernel of why he's taking people to heaven. There's nothing about how much tithe I paid, you know, how faithful I was in coming, uh, coming to worship. There's nothing about how well I, I kept the Ten Commandments or gave Bible studies or about how many people were baptized and came into the church. There's nothing of that at all, which is what we normally talk about in our church. Instead, he's talking about what? How we relate to the most needy people in society. How we rate, relate to the disadvantaged people in society. How do we care for the people around us? And what Jesus is saying is this is how I describe love in action. When we truly love God with all our heart and soul, our mind, and love our neighbor as ourself, then we want to find these people and help these people in any way that, uh, that we can. Now, Paul is talking about this a little further in um, the book of Romans 13. He says, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. This is an eschatological text. This is an end time message. The New Testament believed and taught that Jesus was coming back in the first century over and over, whether you're in Revelation or Corinthians and so on and so on. And so Paul is writing to the Romans and notice the day is almost here. What day? What they were longing for, the, the coming of, of Christ. And he says, the hour has come to wake up from your slumber. But he begins by saying, and do this. What is the do this that he's referring to? It's the few verses just before where he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law, the commandment, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And I could take you for hours going through the New Testament on everything it says about love and how important that is. And one of the things I long for my church, for the Adventist church, is that we learn how to be a much more relational church than a behavioral church. Because good behavior comes out of right relationships. And we wouldn't have all the apostasies. We wouldn't have all the, the people not coming to church if they understood that God is gracious and God is loving. And God accepts us just as we are. And at New Hope, we taught our leaders and congregation that when people walk in the door, we accept them just as they are, no matter how they're dressed whether their skirts are too high or their blouses are too low, and we get those people coming because they understand our church is a very graceful and uh, grace-accepting church. We want people to understand that we love you because God loved us and accept us unconditionally, and we want to accept people. Now, of course, when God pours his grace on us, 
He doesn't leave us as we are. He transforms us so we become more and more like him. But we're all at different stages in this growth, from babies to toddlers to teenagers to mature adults. But once a person is baptized, we kind of treat them now as being a fully mature adult. But when they mess up, you know, we don't think of them still as a baby Christian. I have a grandchild now, seven months old, and I change her diapers every now and then when she's in my home. Sometimes they're really poopy. And I don't look at her and say, how come you've got a poopy diaper? I know that's normal for that age. We have a lot of poopy people in our churches. You know, they may be 55 or 60. Chronological age has nothing to do with their spiritual age. And that's why we're to love people regardless, because we don't always know where they are in their maturity. And what we might consider a sin is not a sin for them, because they've not grown to understand some of the things that we understand and that we, that we um, grow in. So what is our greatest debt? To love one another. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So as I've grown and matured in Jesus and my wife and I, we said, how does God want us to live? Back when we were in Scotland, we took in an Indian lady who was pregnant, who had no home. And her baby was born and lived in our house for about five months till we could find a flat for her in Perth for her to, to live in. And we've tried to, to assist. Some, sometimes neighbors don't want you to make friends. When we move into a new neighborhood, we take a loaf of bread, homemade bread round to them. And we had one who wrote a note saying, please do not give us any more bread or any more gifts. We don't want anything from you. Thank you. We said, okay, if that's how you, you want to be. Um, when I was pastoring New Hope, I decided as I was growing in this whole thing of uh, relationships, and I won't tell you all that I did before on that, I started writing a note to each family in the church. So each day during my devotions, I'd have the church directory, I'd start with A, and I'd go right through to the end, and I made up my own cards on my computer, had a Bible text, and I'd write a short message of telling them I loved them and cared for them and mailed it to them. Then the next day, I'd send one to the next person on the list. And it was amazing the response I got just from that simple little thing. I'd go in people's homes and they'd show me on the notice board in their in their kitchen. There was a note I'd sent five months before still hanging there. And they'd say they'd look at it and read it again. Then I kind of uh, developed a, a, another way of calling people on their birthday. And uh, January I'd have the list of everyone's birthdays. And I'd call them and say this is Pastor David Newman calling to wish you a happy birthday. And I'd, depending how well I knew them, I'd talk a, just a short bit and I'd say may I pray for you. And over the years I've done this, I've only had one person ever say no. He's an atheist, former Adventist, but uh, I'd still call. It doesn't matter whether they were coming or not, as long as they were. And that was the wonderful thing, because I'd get people that weren't coming to church anymore. The best thing about this was, I, I prayed almost that they wouldn't answer. Because when they didn't answer, then I'd leave a message on their answering machine. I discovered home answering machines, I had to be very quick because a lot of them were only 30 seconds long. But when there was a cell phone, I could tell them who I was, and then I would pray for them and leave that prayer. And I, there's, I've forgotten the countless numbers that would tell me how important that prayer was for them and how they would resave it after 30 days, because um, depending which company you have, get, they would resave it so they could listen to it again and again. See, people are dying for this personal touch. We live in a world where it's so easy to just go on our ways, but the essence of the gospel, the last warning message, the way that we are to reveal the character of God, I believe from what the Bible and Ellen White says, is how we love people in the way that God loves us and shares with us. Probably one of the most powerful um, stories uh, that I have read illustrating this power of God's love despite the most difficult circumstances. Back, uh, began back in 1950. Ethel Taylor and her husband Carl had been married for 23 years. They loved each other deeply and uh, he worked for the government um, in warehouses supervising different warehouses and sometimes would be gone on trips to other parts of the country and he'd always write her, uh, no email back in those days, and sometimes bring back a little gift. And uh, um, later in 1950, he had to go to Guam. He was sent to Guam to manage some houses there, and he would still write 
Uh, but then the letters didn't come quite so often, and she thought, well, he's busy, and, 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 and that's fine. And um, she didn't expect any gift because they were saving up to perhaps, you know, buy, buy a house. And then one day, a letter came about a year after he'd been there. He had written, said he had to be delayed, he had to stay a little bit longer. And she opened this letter and it said, Ethel, I don't know how to tell you this, but we're no longer married. And she had to find a seat and sit down and read the rest of it. He said he had um, gone to Mexico for a quickie divorce. He had divorced her and married Ico, uh, maid in the complex where he was living, and he had married her. Ico was 19, Ethel was 48. And Ethel didn't know what to say or what, what to do, but she thought, God is still in all of this. I'm still going to, to, to care for him and, and love him. And um, she said, well, please tell me what's still going on in your life. In 51, uh, he wrote that uh, his first child had been born, uh, Marie, uh, from this marriage to, to Ico. And then in 53, Helen was born. And he'd write about the, f the first tooth, and, and she would write back, said, tell me about, about these children. Then came a letter full of fear and anxiety. He'd been diagnosed with lung cancer, and he only had a short time left to live. And who would care for Ico? And who would care for these two, two girls? And he died. And then as Ethel was praying and asking how God should lead her, she knew that she had to invite those two girls. By this time, they were three and five years old to come to America because Aiko had written, she had hardly any money, she didn't know how to support these girls, and Aiko didn't want to give them up, they were her girls. But finally, in the um, November of 1956, she sent those two girls, three and five, to Aunt Ethel in Waltham, Massachusetts. And so she picked them up at the airport, and they had forgotten most of their English, but they soon got their English back, and for the first time in six years, there was a spring in her step as she came back to the house to, to prepare food for them, and of course they had to be at babysitters because she was working. And Ico would write and say, please tell me about Helen, are they missing me? Tell me about Marie, those are my precious uh, daughters. And then Ethel knew what she needed to do. She need, it was not fair for her to be separated from her family. And so the problem was that Ethel did not have American citizenship. She had not been married evidently to um, uh, Carl long enough, and there was years waiting list for her to come. So she contacted the columnist at the local newspaper and poured out the dilemma, and he wrote a big column, and important people read it, and within a short time, the State Department had issued a permanent visa for her to come to America, and in uh, August of 1957, Ethel went to New York International Airport, wasn't Kennedy Airport at that time, and she didn't know how she was going to feel. Here was this woman that had stolen away her husband. How would you feel towards someone like that? And there wasn't the security we have now, so she was there where the plane was unloading, and Ico was the last one off the plane. And she looked so small, so, so frail. And as she came towards her, Ethel suddenly ran and put her arms around her and hugged her and kissed her and welcomed her and said to herself, I prayed for Carl to come back, but now he's come back in his two precious daughters. He's come back in this wonderful woman, Aiko, and I'm going to love them every way that I can. Excuse me. <laughs> I read a story like that, and I look at the people around. I'm hungering for love, for relationships. That's what God wants our church to be. That's the way the work is going to be finished. Because when people see how much we love them, they're going to ask about the Sabbath. They're going to ask what makes this difference. And then we can explain the context of grace and who Jesus is, and they'll be so open. There won't be the argumentations because they sense that we love them and we care for them. 
So my challenge uh, to you today, and I think we have some time for some questions or observations if you have them, is what kind of Christian Seventh-day Adventist are you? Are you living out the love of Jesus in such a way that when people look at you, they can say, I know you're a Christian by how you treat me, how you love me, how you care for me. Amen. This is a Sabbath school class, so I made a presentation. I don't know if you want to, if there's any observations or questions where I wasn't clear. Please. Um, we, we have uh, four microphones, we'll bring Mike here, so raise your hand, someone will come with you, to you with a mic. I was just observing that the, uh, that the two uh, pictures that you had, one of them was entitled The Way of Life and the other one's Christ, The Way of Life. Right, Christ doesn't appear in this title at all. Yeah. An interesting observation. Yeah. Um, I think one can make the case that the fundamental principle of evolution <laughs> is dog eat dog. That again? I... The fundamental principle of evolution is dog eat dog. Okay, yes. Dog eat dog, yes. That, uh, that you get your way, you get to the top by clawing all of your competitors down with the exception of your children. So nepotism is allowed, but not much else. Um, and that the, the fundamental principle of the original Eden and of the new earth is precisely the opposite. And that the Sabbath may very well stand for that fundamental principle, which is the principle of selfishness versus the principle of love. Yep, thank you. Good summary. Please. I've also read that Christ Object Lesson 69 uh, many times and wondered about it. <clears throat> and I wondered if an additional idea, or, or if, if you see any basis for looking at that, um, that what has been presented as a goal, uh, when the character of Christ will be perfectly reproduced in his people, could that be looked upon as perfectly reproduced in his people as a composite group where some of them exhibit his characteristic of outgoingness, some of them exhibit more perfectly his characteristic of compassion, some exhibit more perfectly his characteristic of peacemaking, and, and so on. I just wondered if, if that has ever entered into um, Yes, yes, I, I, I think your observation is, is very true. And I think that, you see, one of the questions I've had about our traditional teaching of end time events, uh, what's gonna happen to the person who's converted, baptized three days before probation ends? Uh, it takes a lifetime to mature, and yet, obviously, it seems that people are gonna be baptized right up to the end. They don't have much time to suddenly become perfect. And so my understanding is that once we have that conversion experience, we're still going to mess up at times. The difference is we know it and we apologize and we put it right. So what you're talking about, someone having more of this and more of this, and if I do mess up, I suddenly realize that's because of my immaturity, and then I say, please forgive me, I'm sorry, I, I treated, you, treated you that way. Because we're all in on the same basis, what Jesus did for us, not on the basis of how mature we are, or how, you know, how good we are. Okay, we're getting a bunch of questions now. I think the next one I saw the mic going was there, okay. and then where's the next? Someone down here needs the mic in the blue dress. This, uh, to continue on from 69 in Christ Object Lessons, that's the chapter on the first the blade, then the ear. Right. The next chapter that's on the ripening of the wheat and the tares together says, about from 70 on, 72 to 75, basically. It says that probationary time, because the pro this, this preoccupation with the end of probation and being cut off without, is dispensationalism. It's that ugly thing that was brought up by the Counter-Reformation. Now, uh, this this uh, 
a preoccupation and being frozen like a, ra a rabbit in the headlights looking at this coming on and when will it happen we won't know and all that stuff, that uncertainty that drives people out of the church is answered in these pages. It says probationary time ends at the harvest which is at the end of the world. Now that's very clear and it's in a chapter about the finishing up of the, of the ripening process. So it goes until the end of the world. And when he comes down and the righteous who have been glorified are losing that shining, that glory of his presence, that they've been given when he gave the day and hour of his coming from the door of the sanctuary in heaven. When that happens, uh, they have been shining and the glory is a defense against anything else. But when he's coming down and they begin to panic and they say, with the wicked who are panicking, who shall be able to stand? He has to stop the music of the heavenly chorus coming down. And Mrs. White says there's an awesome silence. And he says to them, not don't worry, you're sinless. No, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah. there you are. Yes. Thank you. All right, I think we're up here um, and then down here. Did you have the microphone back there? Oh, you're the next, please. All right. So James White made both of those pictures. Pardon? James White made both of those no, pictures. No, James White did this picture. Ellen White did this picture. Oh, okay. And, and when I present this at camp meetings, um, I do a seminar, and I have these pictures on a, on, a, on a stand holding up. I'll often get a lot of the people come afterwards, and they look very wistfully at this picture because this is where they tend to be. But I emphasize this is the James White picture, but they really love Ellen White, and now they're torn because this is the Ellen White picture, not the James White picture. And now they're having to rethink their whole thinking and emphasis, because the law is gone as the emphasis in this picture. It's all about relationships and who, who Jesus is. So I use these pictures a lot because I believe they're so powerful. You know, they say a picture is worth a, a, a thousand words. When, when did she make that one? When did, she, when did she make that 1883. one? 1883. Oh. All right, was that, okay, back here, and then someone's needing them, please. Um, I live in Rancho Cucamonga, which is a large, prosperous community with no Adventist church, and um, people that I associate with know that I disappear on Saturdays and I get all sorts of questions. Also, Claremont is next to it, and... Um, I get a lot of questions. I go to the Claremont Club, the water aerobics class, and I have people just ask all sorts of questions because they know that I'm different. And, um, and so these are intellectual types who find the uh, Adventist church on the internet. And they read a lot. And I'd like for you, I mean, I listen to you and you sound wonderful and exactly what I think the Adventist church should be. Please, please, please tell me, how are, is this love portrayed in Adventist Today website? Ah, good question. All right, H clarify. Um, or Spectrum, but you don't speak for Spectrum. No, no. But I mean, this is how my friends are getting introduced. Yes. And, and it just tears my heart apart when um, I, I keep up and I just am wrenched by the love we show for each other, quote unquote, on the internet and Adventist Today being one of the sites. Okay, I'm responsible for the printed version. I'm not responsible for anything on the website that we have kind of a, uh, of a divided one there. And the, the website is a challenge because part of our philosophy is that we want to to serve all sides of the church, the left and the right, if you're going to use phrases, the traditionalists and non-traditionalists. And that's why we have bloggers on there like Herbert Douglas, Cindy Touche, who are very conservative, 
bloggers like Irv Taylor, who is on the other side of, uh, of, of the score, and everyone in between. And as a result, and of course, we have no control over the comments that people leave, and sometimes the comments are not always as gracious as, as, as we would like. And therein lies our witness, how we love each other. That's right. That, and that's, yes, absolutely. Um, and so hopefully people won't judge us by what's on Adventist today. They'll judge us by who you are, how we relate to people. And we can explain that we're not a perfect church and we're not a perfect community. And um, uh, how I... I determine when sometimes I comment on the blogs and one of the things I've always determined to do to be as gracious and as kind and as complimentary as I can be. I don't know of any other churches that let it all hang out like the Adventists on the internet. I have not run into a Baptist blog, a Catholic blog, mm -hmm. any of those. I mean, it, it's all out there. Yep. Thank you. It's okay. Yeah. I, I have a book with that picture in. Pardon? I have a book with that picture in, but how do I get a picture of that? Oh, how do you? Well, if you, um, if you ask Dr. Brandstater in my, in my notes, I have copies of the two pictures um, in there, so you can get it for free there. Or you can write the white estate. It's like $3 to get a set of the two, two pictures. They add a third one, which is very nice, a contemporary rendition of this one by Alfred Lee. Alfred Lee, Adventist, uh, uh, has painted this, repainted this in color, and uh, that's included in the packet. So if you just write the white estate, you can order a full set of um, both of these plus the modern color rendition, if you like. Is there someone else? Please back here. <coughs> I had an interesting experience when I lived in Albania for a year as on a self-supporting mission. I couldn't speak Albanian and I shopped at the open market every day. I always wore a cross around my neck and I made up my mind I was going to try to be loving even though I couldn't speak to people. And at the end of my stay, a young woman said to me, my mother wants me to tell you that you are such a kind, loving person. I didn't have to go through the hard work of Bible studies or anything like that, and I don't pr represent this as being a true faith-sharing encounter, but I did find out that you don't always need words to shed some kind of light and encouragement into people's lives. It was, very, uh, it was a very striking experience to me, and I've never forgotten it. Thank you. A very good example. You know, when our church began, it was very Pentecostal in many ways. Uh, we had people speaking in tongues, very emotional. But over time, we became basically a left-brain church and um, a data-driven, a factual doctrine-driven church until so many of our worship services. Um, where I grew up at Stanborough Park in England, I, it's, as a teenager, was sitting in the balcony, and there was one gentleman would say amen during the sermon, and us kids would look and say, look at that crazy old man saying amen. Why would you say amen in a sermon? And the idea was you sit quietly and don't make any you know, comments in, in that particular uh, tradition. And I've come to realize I'm a very left-brain analytical guy, and I went for a year of therapy to try and get my head and my heart connected better and how to deal with my emotions and the whole emotional side of me. Because as an Englishman growing up in an English culture, we're taught to keep the stiff upper lip and uh, you don't let your emotions hang out. And it's taken me a lifetime to try and understand there's a whole other dimension and that when you love, while love is a principle, it also reflects itself in emotions and feelings and, and how you care for people. Um, I would like to just add a note to what she said. Uh, when we were living in Nairobi, Kenya, working for the church there, uh, we heard a mess. We received a message that some Adventists were coming through from Mogadishu, which, of course, is completely a Christian, living under Muslim law, et cetera, et cetera. And we had never heard of these people before, but we said, okay, let them come and stay with us. And one of the very interesting things, it turns out that this gentleman was, uh, they were Adventists, the whole family. He was a big diesel mechanic working for the U.S. Embassy. And, of course, therefore, he had access to the 
diplomatic pouch. He could order anything he want and have it sent right to Mogadishu. And he ordered all the Adventist magazines. He says we were never able to speak the language or anything else like this, but he ordered all, especially the colorful ones, the Adventist magazines. They would come to him through the pouch, and every week they would put their garbage can out very early in the week. And they would leave the lid off, and they would always put the Adventist magazines right on top. <laughs> and he said none of those magazines ever got to the dump. It's very interesting ways, if, you're, if you think outside the box, there's some yeah. very interesting ways to share the gospel. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have um, answered. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, the, the, the law is, is, um, is back here. See the lightning and see the ma mountain? That's, um, okay, here, here's Mount Sinai, and here's the lightning and so on from God. So the law is still represented, but it's way, way in the background. It's not the focus like it was in the other. So what I'm saying is everything in that picture is still in this picture. It's just the focus has changed from the law tree and the commandments to Jesus on the cross being the focus. And it's very hard for Adventist churches to understand what that means. We want to have it both ways. We want to have equally Jesus, equally the doctrines. You can only have one focus. There's no way to have two foci. Although Herb Douglas has tried to develop what he calls the elliptical concept where you have an ellipse, so you have the cross at this end and you have the doctrines at the other end, which is an interesting way of trying to, to deal with this. But I still believe that when you look at scripture and even Ellen White, after 1888, from my count and investigation, 90% of practically everything she wrote on grace and the atonement came after 1888. And her best books, Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, Christ Object Lessons, Ministry of Healing, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, came after 1888. And after Jones and Wagner in the 88, she was trying to change the church from this picture to this picture. But Smith and Butler, you know, resisted. And um, later on, um, of course, she, she died. And then there was the big time in the 20s of fundamentalism and Adventism in reaction became even more fundamental and I, I believe that Ellen White's dream of this being the focus has never truly been achieved in our church uh, yet and that that is still so much the focus but that's my personal opinion thank you um, my comment or question has to do again with the, the two pictures and I'm wondering if maybe uh, part of the reason people gravitate to the first one is just a little bit compositionally. This is the second picture there that you were just holding up, uh, there's more use of, of color or darker pen yes, in yes. it. There's that in the background, the, the mountain and the lightning. Uh, the cross casts a large shadow and the light is in the very far background up on the, the left or the right side. Yes. Whereas on that other picture, it's uh, lighter shades of pen, lighter grays. Yeah, yeah. There's only the more gray, darker part is the actual tree, which doesn't seem as ominous as the the lightning and the cross and in the in the in the uh, after the, the later picture. Yeah. And I wonder if people gravitate to that first picture because it seems more of a, a happy type. I'm I'm picture. sure that's you know that that's part of it too. And you're the first person that's. You must be an artist or something there that's kind of commented on that. But you're right. Uh, th this picture is very different comp with light and dark than, uh, than, than that picture um, is there. Um. Also, now I'm very, oh, sorry. I am very far in the back from the picture, but it really appears there's a boa constrictor or something around the Lord's waist. Oh, you mean on this one? Yeah. Well, they're being polite, because when he was crucified, he had nothing on. So if we were truly authentic, okay. he'd be just there naked. Because okay, that, that was part of the disgrace of, of crucifixion okay. was there was no modesty. You were just um, hung up there naked. So we've, we've okay. tried to, our artists have tried to put something around because they figured that'd be a bit too much for, for people to, to look at uh, today. So, yeah, um, I don't know who that artist was that drew that, but it's... Uh, it does look a little, little funny there. It is not a boa constrictor. 
<laughs> That's a, yes. I think you're supposed to finish at what time? No. Now, all right. Well, let's have a prayer as we conclude today. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the word, for the Bible. But even more important than that, I pray is that each of us in this room will not just know in our head that you are God and you're our Savior, but we will know in our heart and emotions and truly experience your love and your acceptance. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I did bring... If any of you don't get Adventist today, I did bring a few um, extra copies here of the last issue, which is Kingly Power, is it uh, finding a place in the Adventist church? So, very interesting current, uh, current time. So, I got a few extra of these if some people would like a, like a copy. Thank you.